Cool. So I'll get going. Um, first off, just like to say a big thanks to the sponsors. It's been said a few times this morning, but it, uh, it's really true. These sort of events couldn't happen without them. So. Um, thanks again. I'd also like to say thanks to the DDD Perth team. I've come over from Melbourne today and they've been super helpful about organising things, making sure I've got plenty of info and know what to do. Um, and thanks to anyone in the room that voted to get me to talk about basically one of my pet projects that I'm doing at work at the moment. And thank you all for coming along to this talk. There's a lot of great talks on today, so you could have went to anyone. Thank you very much for coming along to this one. So... I'm going to talk a bit, but like I say, it's a bit of a pet project for me at the moment. It's something I'm doing at work, at the site of work, but I'll explain that a little bit at the moment. It's building a conversational user interface. Prior to this, a quick show of hands, who'd actually heard of the term conversational user interface? Oh, good, okay, cool. Um, so, probably the most polite place to start is a bit of an introduction. My name's Norman Noble. Um, just for those that aren't aware, Norman's not a name you typically tend to find in somebody that's under 70 years old, so <laughs> if you're expecting an older guy, that's me, it's the name I've got. Um, I work at a company in Melbourne called Seek, uh, or rather our headquarters are in Melbourne, but we're actually in about 14 different countries around the world. Uh, it's a great company, um, they have a kind of a purpose that they, they talk a lot about where it's helping people have fulfilling and uh, meaningful careers and helping companies succeed. I work as what's called a technical practice manager there, so uh, that's a lot of different things really, but um, I guess what it really means is I get to spend all day every day hanging out and uh, working with a bunch of really talented, passionate oh, wow. engineers, so it's, it's basically a bit of a dream job for me. Um, there's my Twitter and, Twitter and email, I don't actively tweet, I'm more of a lurker than a, a contributor, but um, I might put up some links if anyone asks about some of the stuff I'm going to show on this later on, and if there's any questions you can ping me on that email address, I'm, I'm happy to respond. So probably the first thing I want to cover off is what is a conversational user interface. So there's a, like about 50-50 split of who's heard of it before. Um, you know, just looking around, there's a whole bunch of definitions. This is one I found that I quite like. Um, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but effectively what a conversational user interface, if you think about the relationship we've had with computers over the years, basically it's been completely on their terms. We communicate with them in a way that works for them. We learn their quicker little languages, their little commands. We learn their interfaces. It's all completely the way they need it to happen. A conversational user interface flips that around a little bit where they have to learn how to talk in our terms effectively. They have to learn natural English or whatever language you're actually talking in. Uh, and they also um, tend to exhibit the behavior of mimicking a human, like a really good conversational user interface um, should be indistinguishable from a human. Um, generally, they're kind of separated into two broad areas at the moment. The first one's voice assistants. So I'm sure probably the vast majority have got a voice assistant of sorts in your pocket. Siri, Google Now, Cortana, if you're that way inclined. And uh, Alexa is not really big in Australia. It's part of the Amazon Echo platform, but um, it's, it's one as well. So it's, it's quite telling that like four out of the five big main IT companies in the world at the moment are investing in this area and actually developing this. Um, it's an okay area. I mean, um, personally, you can probably tell I'm not Australian. So for me, using a Siri is actually a lot more challenging than most people. I usually have to feign an Australian accent to actually get it to do anything for me. Um, and also, I, I find they're a bit clunky, and I, I'm never quite sure what they can do for me. Most of the time, I actually just it's for cooking barbecue stuff, like set time or two minutes. That's about the extent I actually use voice assistants for. The other category falls under chatbots, and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, but when thinking about chatbots, um, I don't want to get confused with uh, the different types of chatbots. There are chatbots that exist in like Slack and WhatsApp and other platforms where you're basically issuing slash command, just saying slash do this, slash do that. And that's more of a command line interface in a chat platform. That's not really what I'm talking about. When I talk about conversational user interfaces, uh, what I mean is something that you actually engage with as you would a person and you initiate a conversation and it then talks and communicates with you to get more information out of you before finally going off and doing a task. So there are the common ones at the moment, Stack, WhatsApp, Messenger, Skype, WeChat. So why did I want to build one? Um, well like I say, I mentioned it was a bit of a, a pet project. Um, and when I was trying to think about this for the presentation, what were the reasons that I actually wanted to build this? Um, I kind of grouped them roughly into two categories. And there's the personal reasons and then there's the professional reasons. 
So I'm going to cover the, uh, the personal reasons first. So obviously being called Norman, growing up in the 90s, uh, being into computers, just had nerd written all over me. Um, yeah, it was unavoidable. So, you know, I was into all the usual things, Star Trek, Dungeons and Dragons, all that kind of stuff. And I remember around about, I can't remember exactly when, around about 1995 when the new series of Star Trek, The Next Generation, came out. And I remember watching that with my dad, and he was, like, super enthusiastic about it. He was talking about the old Star Trek, sitting down and watching it. And, you know, they introduced a whole bunch of things, you know, faster than light ships, hol uh, holodecks, um, a Klingon working with them. And there was a whole bunch of stuff, but the thing that really stuck out for me was the, the concept of the Star Trek computer. They kind of just, like, dropped it in there matter-of-factly, where people could just wander about the ship and say anything like, computer, tell me, I don't know, make me some soup, or computer, do this, computer, do that. And that part, like, really stuck with me. I, I mean, I remember at the time trying to fathom out how could something like that possibly work? How would it know that you were talking to it and trying to give it an instruction over referring to it in some other third-party conversation? So it kind of... Star Trek definitely was a big influence on, on me and that sort of stuff, so that, that was something I was really interested in. That's the Star Trek bit, Christian, yeah. Um, more recently, I guess, um, probably back in March... I read an article about Jill Watson. Hands up who read this article about Jill Watson? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, cool. That's not Jill Watson. <laughs> that's, um, that's, I struggle to remember his name. That's Professor Ashok Guel, I think is how you pronounce it. It's a French name, I'm not 100%, but I think that's how you pronounce it. And he's a comp sci professor at Georgia Tech in the States. Um, he runs, obviously, the computer science program there. And uh, the article, basically without spoiling what it was about, uh, was around about how over the course of a year with 300 students, he has to field around about, and I couldn't actually believe the number, I had to double check it, but 10,000 queries over the year from his students. Uh, and it comes on online forums, emails, all manners. And it's things, silly things like, you know, when is this paper due? What do we need to know about this? And interestingly, all the information is actually available as FAQs and a lot of the web material that they put out, but nobody actually uses it. They still just email this guy. So obviously over the years, he's developed a program that um, allows him to deal with this. He has what's called eight TAs, or technical assistants. And they're kind of, I think they're latter year students that basically it goes towards extra credits or whatever. They, they perform as a technical assistant. So these guys do the bulk of the work and a lot of it is fairly mundane. Um, last year they had a new technical assistant called Jill Watson and um, she quickly got a reputation for being really good, like answering answer really quickly, no matter when, day or night. Um, always had the correct answer and actually started answering questions issued by the other TAs. They were like, oh, I don't know about this, and Jill would pipe in, well, I actually, I do, and this is what it is. Um, and, you know, everyone was raving about Jill Watson, how great a job she was doing, and but the funny thing was, nobody could put a face to who Jill Watson actually was. And then some people started querying it, and it actually turned out that Jill Watson was IBM Watson running in the background, and that this guy had um, run a sort of trial program um, I had to dig a bit deeper to get the details on it, but it, what they'd actually done is for the first three months of the year, uh, Watson had actually just been monitoring the flow of questions and the material that was coming through, and it was working out how best to answer it. Now, it started off not great, and it, was, but it progressively got better and better. Once it got up to the point where it was answering questions with 97% certainty, um, it was a correct answer. They just unleashed it, and it was a, a raging success. I think maybe one student had worked out it might be a, a bot or a, um, an AI program working in the background. So that was a really cool story, and that kind of re-sparked my kind of, oh, this stuff's cool and I want to look at it. Um, and I guess kind of, I've always sort of weirdly been interested in just human-machine relationship. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I get very attached to my hardware. Like, I'm sure I've, I've winked and smiled at my Mac a few times. Um, but, you, you know, and then I read stories about, like, um, U.S. military, or um, people out in the U.S. military, and um, there's a story about a bomb disposal team that had a, a giant bot, these bots that they send in, and they like physical robots, and they dismantle bombs, and this robot had X amount of successful dismantles, and the, the team had just grown super attached to it. It had a name, they decorated it, um, but obviously it was starting to break down, it was a machine, so it had to go back for servicing, and like, the team were super adamant, get that bot, like that exact one comes back to us, don't swap it out for another one, it has to be that bot, so it kind of shows that the, the relationships people build up with technology is actually in this weird transition period. So, yeah, it's just an interesting area of mine. Obviously, if I just said all that at work and said, hey, I'd like to build a conversational user interface, I'd be 
told I was insane and told no. So I kind of had to start thinking about um, how I could apply this in a sort of practical context. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I work for Seek, and I guess one of the things that I thought that conversational user interfaces were particularly good at was taking high, I guess how we say it, high friction, uh, difficult tasks and making them easy to execute. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but what I mean by that is um, something that would ordinarily have a lot of steps and you'd have a ve very large involvement with, uh, and it's frustrating, you can actually do quite simply uh, with a conversational user interface. So I looked around at some of the practical things that I could do with that, and one of them came out, um, was pretty obvious, booking meetings. I don't know how often, that if, how many meetings you guys have to go to. In my job, I have to go to a lot of meetings. Unfortunately, I have to organize a lot of meetings. And it's, it's one of the biggest bains in my life. I hate doing it. Um, basically, if I have a meeting with four or five people, I have to open up Outlook, I have to get a new appointment, I have to add them into the calendar. I then get the stretch of their availability and I have to comb through it and look for a, the, the slot that matches everything. You know, the stars align greatly and I think, great, I found a slot. And I think, ah, oh, I forgot to add the room and I go in and I add the room and that's, oh, that room can't do that slot and then I back through the whole process. It's really painful. That's with four or five people. When it's large 30 people meetings, it can get, it becomes absolute hell. So I actually thought, conceptually, what am I trying to do here? All I want to do is organize a meeting. All I want to say is um, to uh, whoever, can you book a meeting with these four people at the next available slot? That's all I want to do. So I thought that was actually a potential candidate for actually converting into something in a conversational user interface. Oh, another area that we uh, have some challenges in at Seek is feedback. So there's two types, types of feedback. There's the feedback that you give people day to day, you know, hey, good job, well done. Um, and there's the feedback that happens as part of your performance review. So we use a system at work called Workday and um, it's, it's okay, it does a good job. Um, but the way that you actually give people feedback or get feedback in that, you kind of have to open up Chrome, go into Workday, search for the person, find the button that says give feedback and it's buried away in a sub menu somewhere and I can never remember where it is. So I just don't because that's just painful. And then likewise, when somebody asks me for feedback, I have to go through a similar process. So I'm not a fan of it. And what that means is you get to the end of the year and you know, you're talking about your end of your performance review and let, let's talk about all the feedback you got and nobody's got any. So they, what happens is you get this tidal wave of feedback requests coming through and I have to, and it's like, can you please give me some feedback on that project we worked on nine months ago? And it's like, no, I, I can't remember anything about that to be honest. So you know, really all I actually want to do is at the point in time when it happens, give something, say, hey, I just worked with Dave on this project. He did an awesome job. Um, I'd just like to give him some positive feedback or words to that effect. But the system we use at the moment is high friction, so nobody does it. So I thought that's maybe another potential candidate for um, a conversational user interface. And then the last one, there's, I, I'm, I'm sure you've got it at, um, at many companies, you know, there's the repetitive questions. We have uh, boards up that tell us all sorts of things like where to get ISOs, how to log into the VPN, uh, but nobody uses them. It, it, usually we jump on our chat platform that you use and there's one or two guys that basically, they're the guys that you always ask, where do I get that ISO from? How do I install this? Where's the key for this? So I thought actually, you know, this is potentially something to maybe take the load off them and a bit in the vein of what was going on with uh, Jane Watson. So that was kind of personal reasons, and I guess these are the, the professional reasons, these are the things that I thought I can, I can work into um, my actual work. With me so far? Cool. So, building a prototype, again, um, I can't necessarily just uh, decide that I'm going to do this, uh, I've got regular work to do as well. But uh, luckily at Seek we run biannual hackathons. Um, I think a lot of companies are doing this now, I think it's a great way to kind of fl flesh out ideas like this and actually get them some traction. Um, but yeah, we run a bi biannual hackathon and if you're not familiar with the format of a hackathon, um, effectively just before um, you have a, a date set and time that's going to take place and people start pitching ideas and the ideas are around internal efficiencies or th making things better for our clients and, and it's open to the whole company. People can just submit ideas um, and, and then we have like what's called the, the pitch pulpit where the people whose idea it is gets up and they make a, a heartfelt pitch about what they're trying to do and they try and get, I need technical resources to do this, I need marketing people can do that. So that, that was a perfect opportunity for me to actually sort of spread my idea and get a team in to have a look at it. 
um, and we had a three day hack where basically you just put all regular work to one side and you have three days dedicated to work on this. So um, they're, they're a great format, hackathons, and we've actually, not quite yet, uh, at seek.com, 5% of our audience at the moment are getting our brand new, uh, what's called homepage and SERP or search engine results page. And that has been bred directly out of a hackathon. That was a React project like a while back when we were just first looking at React. So, you know, it actually does make it to full production systems. So obviously I had this the kind of time to do it. I had the people that were interested in doing it. I had to think, well, if we're gonna do this sort of thing, how are we actually gonna build it at Seek? And um, first off, I had to kind of work out, you know, what platforms this is going to be on. Now, you know, things like Siri and that, I just thought, well, I, I don't get on with Siri that well anyway, and I don't think that would actually work for this type of format. But what is really prevalent at Seek is Slack. Who's using Slack at the moment in their work? Oh, about half, okay. If you're not using it, I really recommend looking at it. It's become an integral part to the way we do things at Seek. I mean, literally from teams just collaborating to wider teams collaborating to the, I guess one of the greatest things about Slack is the integration of tools that you actually get. It tells us when our builds are broken. It tells us when APIs are starting to wobble a little bit. Um, it is a really great tool. So the idea was everyone in the company's on Slack anyway. That'd be a perfect place to actually have something like this. And initially we started looking at just working against the raw uh, Slack API, which was workable, but it was actually quite challenging. It was more focused around concepts that were familiar to Slack, so like messages and streams and sessions and stuff that I didn't really want to have to think about because they weren't related to the kind of thing that I was trying to build. So we did that for a little bit and that was getting along okay. And then we came across uh, I'm really sorry, it's a terrible logo and I did look really hard, but it's just shrunk in the middle of this big blue blocks, but it's called BotKit, it's by Howdy UI. And what they've done is they've kind of put a node abstraction around, well, the Slack interface and then a whole bunch of other ones. So basically it's a chat platform you can use for multiple, sorry, it's a chat library you can use for multiple platforms. So it worked great, it meant that we could sort of design our chat in this system and then if we wanted to move from Slack to something else at a later date we could. And it really, it had the concepts of conversation baked into it. So you were thinking about how a conversation works rather than try to work out mentally how does English translate to the Slack API. That got us so far and uh, we actually got a really good start with that. Um, but unfortunately, just with those two, you're kind of still a little bit limited in terms of um, the type of interface you could desi design was still very much based on keyword or key phrase initiation. So I had to programmatically say, uh, if we use the feedback example, I want to leave some feedback and it was a very specific English string. And I could augment it and you know put slight variations on that, but it all still felt a bit, you know, it felt very, um, it wasn't quite what I'd thought of when I thought I want this thing to understand what I'm saying irrespective of the way I, under I say it. So I started exploring natural language processors uh, and machine learning tools that did it and I came across a couple and was actually gobsmacked about how low barrier they were to start using. These guys, API.ai are the ones we ended up using in the end. Um, yeah, I'm gonna show you a little bit in, in a minute, but it's phenomenally simple to use um, and you get really good results with it. The other one that I looked at was what.ai, so that's W-A-T.ai. Uh, they were recently acquired by Facebook, um, which could mean Facebook either really believe in them or they're gonna just bury them. I, I don't know what's gonna happen there. But I opted away from those guys because they seem to want to keep you on platform. So, you know, they wanted to manage the conversation. They wanted to know all the, the, the details of what you were working on. And it kind of had that weird Facebook want to know everything about you vibe about it. So I just kind of, I avoided them. But these guys, API.ai, it's really polished. Documentation's excellent. And they're really responsive to helping you have, if you have questions. So I am going to try and show you a quick demo of the various bits and pieces. I'm tethered to a phone and I'm hoping that everything works. Um, Let's see, and I'm on super resolution here. So probably the first thing to show you, if you haven't seen Slack, right? Obviously it's ridiculous, <laughs> so the resolution is not great. Um, but building a bot on Slack is actually reasonably trivial. You can just jump into, and if you haven't got Slack at work, you can actually just go sign up for Slack yourself. It doesn't cost you anything. This is my personal account that I don't pay for, and it, it just runs constantly. Um, but you can jump into the, oh, this is gonna be tough here and look at uh, apps and integrations. Hmm, it is responsive and it's changed. Hold on, menu, manage, apps. 
Where are we? Sorry, I'm not used to the actual um, responsive custom integrations. No, it's probably apps. Yeah, you'll have to excuse me. I'm not familiar with the responsive layout, but in there effectively there's an option that says create a bot, and it's literally that. You just create a bot, give it a name, and it gives you an API key that you use in your program. So that once you're up and running with that in Slack, you end off with... Uh, if I can actually get back to there. Oh. Bear with me a second. Got it. Oh yeah. Previous tab. Oh yeah, got you. Mm. Yeah, sorry. There we go. So basically, once you create that, you end off getting one. It'll just appear here as a character, like it would with a regular person. Um, I'm not very inventive. I love Marvel comics. So my one's called Jarvis. Um, and yeah, basically that then exists as soon as you create it. You then take that API key and you fire up um, effectively what is a node service. Now the way I actually chose to architect this, I did this in a quite a particular way where um, I wanted this bot to do a whole bunch of things. I didn't want to have a bot for, oh, you have to excuse the terrible code, it was hack code, so yeah, it's all over the place. Um, but the, I didn't want this, I want this bot to do a lot of different things. I didn't want to have a bot for pager GE, a bot for feedback, a bot for, you know, people having to remember which bot they had to speak to. So I just wanted one that, you know, people could communicate with. So I had to think about how I was going to architect it. And basically all a bot does, like I said earlier, is it collects a bunch of information and creates an and fires against an API. So I just organized mine in such a way that it was a service, it ran a node, um, and basically it monitored Slack, listened for key phrases, which was the first pass I'll show you, and then fired off in a library and basically triggered the API with the information that it collected. All this stuff is sitting up on GitHub. We've we've made it uh, open source, so I mean it's not pretty. It's a three D hack, but feel free. I'll put, I'll tweet out the link to it, and you can go up and play with it yourself. But effectively, just skipping quickly through the code, I don't want to go through it line by line, but you're just requiring in the bot kit and a few other bits and pieces. And the important stuff to look out for is spawning up the actual bot, which is here, determining the events that you actually want to tack on into. So in Slack, there's a concept of types of events, and the, the ones I want to look out for are direct messages, direct mentions, or mentions. And then I tell it to hear um, everything. And then effectively it does a couple of checks. The first check is just to make sure that it's not hearing itself. It's making sure it's not the bot that's talking. And it also ignores direct mention. So if I direct mention you, then it wouldn't pick up on that. After it's worked out, it's none of those two things. Um, it scrubs the information a little bit, does a few things that you need to do with bot kits, but then effectively um, it'll check and say, if it has this, I'd like to leave some feedback, then execute something that's in the library, which here's feedback. That part in here, um, here's feedback. It's where you're passing through the controller, the bot, and the message, and this is where you actually instigate the conversational piece of the Howdy bot kit. So you can actually see bot.start conversation, and then you can say convo.say the response. So, like I say, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but effectively you get, you get the gist. The, the Howdy bot kit is the framework that's actually used to start maintain and build a conversation and it's a little bit like writing a choose your own adventure story kind of you you, you kind of have to like work out how the story works and that was actually for me where it got really interesting because some of the things that you take for granted as a human being in terms of how easily you identify what people are saying turn out to be super hard to get down on code because it can be so easily misinterpreted but like i say i'll, I'll tweet out the link and you can have a, a look through this code at your own time um but where did we go? This guy here. So like I say, it executes. Uh, and this was the first pass of it. So this is what I was talking about where it was literally just matching. I'd like to leave some feedback. So if I actually fire up that guy. And it's gone. And then I should see it. My bot's now running, and I can say things like, hi, and it'll ignore me because it doesn't know what to do with that. And then if I say things like, leave some feedback. So that's the exact phrase that I've got coded in the first pass. It should. 
Say, no problem, let me grab a pen and paper. Now, again, part of the trick of these uh, chatbots is trying to make them seem really human. Um, you get a lot of things, which I'll talk a bit about at the end, by by being more human with people. But what, you, what you're effectively doing here is kicking off like a workflow. You're now engaged in a conversation where you can grab little bits of uh, information out of it. So you can't see all of it, but state the full name. So I'll just go, Andrew, not the full name, but you get the idea. Um, and the project was a hackathon. And we have something called seek attributes. So we'll say one of the most passion and uh, he codes super angry, <laughs> which isn't a lie. He did. It was really scary. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, the he's, one of, he's one of our DevOps guys, and he never normally does it, but he, he yeah. Anyway, done. That's the, the only way I, I can think of at the moment to terminate the conversation. There might be smarter ways to do that. Okay, data is received, and he, he's, this thing's telling me because I'm not in the Seek network, it can't connect to the API. But you get the idea. It would collect up all the information in a conversational style and then post it off to an API. The API would send something back and say, great received. So this, we did a bit of a test with some people on, you know, doing this on the, the Workday system versus doing this, and overwhelmingly people found this, uh, like, much easier and uh, more inclined to use it. The challenge we had with this, unfortunately, was the Workday API didn't work quite in the way that we thought it did or the documentation suggested, so we've actually submitted a pull request to them to fix that, and we can actually start integrating it. So at the moment, um, or I think that's happened at least, hopefully, um, at the moment we're just basically sticking an encrypted database in a AWS. So you can kind of see, and we, you know, we had a similar thing where, um, where you know, we can arrange meetings. I can say, hey, I'd like a meeting. I'd like these people in it, and it come back, and it, what it would do is go off in the background and say, right, I've checked your calendar, all their calendars, and meeting room availability, and you've got these three options. Which one would you like? And you can say, oh, I'll have that meeting room, uh, please, and it'll just, and then it'll go back and it'll organize a meeting. You'll get your meeting request. It's like far less friction in organizing meetings. We came across another little niggle there, and at Seek, when we set up Exchange, they just set up some default settings and some things, so nobody ever actually defined what a working day was at Seek. So according to the, the Seek Exchange ca uh, time frame, our working day started at, I think it was 1 a.m., and finished at like 12 p.m. last night, so it was basically 24 hours. So you send it off to the, the bot, and it would come back and say, yeah, great, I found your meeting room like today. Uh, three, you can meet at 10 o'clock tonight. Is that good? So we, we've got a few things to... <laughs> we've, got, we've got to fix the underlying systems that support these things, which we're, we're working on as well. Um, so that was the first pass. That was kind of the, the very, you know... Um, based on a key phrase, uh, very inflexible, and it, you know, I didn't think there was gonna, you were going to get people to use this if they had to know the exact command because I could just imagine people be firing around a Slack. What's the thing I have to say to Jarvis to make him do this? And that's not what I actually wanted. So that's when I started looking into these guys, and what I'll do is I'll actually, if I can. I'll take you through this. There's actually quite a lot to go through in this, so I'll try and take it through reasonably quickly. But um, the way that this stuff works is basically there's, I guess, three main concepts you have to be familiar with. It's the concept of entities, intents, and um, contexts. So with entities, that's kind of anything that you would speak about in a sort of domain sense. So one example might be at Seek we talk a lot about production. So that might be an entity, but people refer to it as prod, live, whatever. You know, there's, there's a bunch of different things. So that's our entity. And you can go into the entities and define the entities that make sense in your domain. So for the feedback one, you know, what you normally do is list a bunch of synonyms. So for feedback, there's feedback, observation, assessment. And what you do is you fill up the entities to sort of define your environment. And then the intents are the way that it actually works out what you're trying to say. So when you define an intent with an entity, you're basically saying to it, um, you can give it an exact English phrase, so I'll show you. So there's a feedback one that I did as a demo. So I'd like to give some feedback at feedback, feedback. So the feedback part there is the entities. I don't know why it doubles up on the word feedback now. This changes quite a lot, and that's just come in uh, since yesterday, so I'm not sure why it's doing that. But eff effectively, I've defined an intent, and then I can say things like, well, how else would people say this? Can I give some feedback? Oh, sorry. Uh, 
uh, are you know, what they recommend is coming up with about four or five different ways of saying the same thing, you know, and, and, uh, to give you some variety. And then what that'll do in the background is when you send messages to this thing, which is reading all the messages, and if you direct message it, um, it'll work out given the user says statements that you've provided and the entity has provided any sort of combination of that sort of thing. So if I was to say I'd like to give some uh, <laughs> observation or assessment or um, you can test it out over at this side and say try it now. So um, basic one would be I'd love to give some feedback and then it'll work out, the user says that, the speech response is okay, so the intent is give feedback. It works out the intent of what you're trying to say. So you can then start saying things, can I give Andrew some feedback? And it's actually working out in the background, you know, I think to a high degree that you're saying this. It gets, it's, it's very good, it actually gets a lot of stuff. You gotta be careful when you start getting a broader domain and you, it can start to get a bit confused depending on how you train it. And it also monitors everything that you say to it that it can't satisfy and there's a history tab that you can go through and say, it'll show you things like, they said this and I think they mean that, but I didn't have enough certainty to actually execute that. And you can go through and say, yeah, you were right, you were right, you were right. And you can train the, the, uh, the bot like that. It, there's dragons in there though, I mean you, you gotta be really careful because it's really easy to screw it up and Thanks. things start getting a bit hairy so like I said just try it lightly, keep it to a closed domain, try and make it specific and try and keep the conversation short just until you work out how it's going. So that's uh, api.ai. So everyone with me on that? Yep. Good. Okay. So obviously oh, when you wire up the bot I had before, so it's got a lot more requires. Um, this has actually got some of the ones that we did. We did stuff with production incidents, feedback, AWS, bookings. It was great, we were able to go in and say, how much have we spent on AWS this month? And it just connected with Cloudability and came back, well, do you mean by account, or do you mean you know EC2 instances? So um, we were able to do that. But the main difference in this one, it's largely the same, apart from the fact where, this point here, it sends a request off to the API AI service text request. You just send it off. And what you actually end off doing is getting back one of those actions that you've defined in your intents. And then based on the action that you get back, you can then channel the conversation in the area you want. We only did it like first level, so it was, we used the intent engine to work out how to start a conversation. If you want to start getting really clever with it, you could have intents being worked out as you go along so that you start a conversation and then you could go this way and the other. I'd imagine that's gonna start getting quite complicated, but it's definitely possible. Um, and one other thing I didn't touch on, sorry, on the API AI interface is the notion of context. That was something that I, I kind of learned, uh, I guess I've been aware, but it. it was something I specifically learned going through this, that as human beings, it's really easy for us to retain context for long periods of time. So in the example of this talk, I, I, before every statement, I haven't had to proceed it with, I'm talking about conversational user interfaces. You know, I haven't had to refresh the context every single time. Uh, it's really hard for uh, programs and computers to do that. So. API.ai has a, a concept of context, and what you can do is at your intent, you can create input context and output context. And it allows you to do things like, uh, when you're having a conversation, you may say something like, uh, please close the door. You know, you're being very specific about an entity at the back and you, it's clear intent. And it might have an output context of door. You know, I'm talking about a door right now. So that if you follow that up with a following uh, statement of, please open that, it knows well the context about a door, so I know I'll open the door. So context we haven't played around with too much because they started getting complicated quite quick, but it's in there and you can do it. So that's the, the intent, the contents, and the entities at a, a highest level. And again, this is, like I say, it basically we work out from the response and we get back an action, and the actions were coming back from API.ai, and that determined which path we followed to flesh out the rest of the conversation. Right, what am I doing for time? How long have we got? Okay, cool. So, where are we? So what I learned along the way, um, this is quite interesting. So getting started is super easy. I guess the point of me coming and talk to you about this stuff is it's really cool and it's really good fun to play with and like it really, it's all free. Um, it's really low entry and you kind of get that weird vibe that you had when you first wrote a web page or you first started your first app code that oh this is actually something quite cool um so you know i'd recommend going and have a look at the stuff that i've mentioned today 
Um, it does get complicated really quickly. I don't want to undersell it. English is a really complicated language to speak and understand. So, you know, doing basic stuff um, is super easy, but you've just got to have a really measured approach to what am I trying to achieve here and how am I going to do it. I yeah, <laughs> Christian challenges that every day. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned before, humans are actually naturally good at it. We do it all the time without even thinking about it. It's like, as a Scot, um, I say things all the time and I can usually tell when people are doing it, there's a little bit of squint and they're mentally processing what I just said and going, yeah, I know what he means, this is what he's talking about. But we actually do it on the fly all the time. So actually programming intention and actually working that out and getting it correct is reasonably easy in a closed domain when we're talking about a specific thing. but. When you uh, talk about a broad topic, you know, we could be jumping from politics to sport. It actually gets really quite difficult, quite hard. And quite fast, sorry. Um, and I guess the thing that really um, interested me the most is like going through all this. I actually did a bit of reading on where current things are in the field of AI. And I was like really surprised how progressed they actually were. Um, we are currently, um, I guess, AI can be broadly categorized into three sort of categories. Um, the first of which is called ANI, which is artificial narrow intelligence, and that's we've had that for a long time. That's the the same thing like um, you go on Amazon, buy a book, and it thinks you'll like this book because you like that book. Um, it's very specific, closed domain kind of stuff. And uh, the next level on from that's what's called uh, AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. And there's things that are moving towards that at the moment, uh, but that's kind of like dumb human AI, which I guess Jane Watson could almost pass off as and you know we're some of the reports I read estimate we're projected to have that part of our daily life as soon as 2020. The really scary one which is ASI which is artificial super intelligence that's Skynet, Terminators, um, that's an artificial intelligence that has a collective intelligence of every, every human being ever. Um, a lot of people think that you know it's taken us this long to get through ANI and then that long to get to AGI that'll take that long to get to ASI, but it's actually an S curve, and the, the period of time they estimate between AGI and ASI is actually reasonably short. You know, you'll have intelligent programs going from dumb human to Albert Einstein in a really short space of time. So it's it's, it's an interesting field, and it's you know it's 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 cropping up everywhere at the moment. Um, even at Seek, we now have an artificial intelligence team that are working on how can we implement this in our in our products. Um, and most importantly, it, like I mentioned before, it, it's it's really good fun. Um, just have a play around with it, see what you think. Um, if you think about the fact that there's millions of people already on chat platforms um, at the moment, the potential for this in terms of integrating into a lot of people's lives are absolutely huge. Um, yeah, this was one last point actually I felt I had to mention that conversational user interfaces are ridiculously hard to test and debug. Because if you think about it, you've actually, especially if they're long, if you have a conversation that has many points in it and then you think, oh, that's not quite right or hasn't done it quite right, in the sense of Slack, you kind of have to make your adjustment and then go through the process of talking through the conversation again. I mean, that's how we're doing it at the moment. I'm sure there's smarter ways of doing it and maybe test bots that talk to actual bots and I, I don't know, but <laughs> at the moment it was really bloody painful. So um, yeah, we, we need to look at that a little bit. I guess where I can see things going from here, <clears throat> um, well, you know, it's happening already. Um, KLM, which is a European carrier, um, you can now go into Messenger and book flights through KLM. Uh, I believe you can order Domino Pizza through Messenger as well. It, it's, it's becoming more prevalent. People are uh, um, embracing this and, and feeling comfortable engaging with machines in this way. Um, the interesting part is there's a bit of a moral debate on whether or not we should be calling out that they're actual bots. There's a lot of psychological gains when people think that they're talking to a human. They tend to leak more information, whereas they're a lot more guarded when they think they're talking to a machine. So it's the, do you call out up front, hi, I'm a bot, you're talking to a bot, or do you just let them believe it's actually a human being to try and get more information? So uh, like after learning what I did, I've now got this really weird, uncomfortable feeling whenever I talk to a chat service. It's like, are you a bot or a person? And they're like, ha, 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 I'm a person. It's like, that's what a bot would say. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I usually throw in a couple of uh, Turing test questions into there. Um, and yeah, and this is something I think is going to be really interesting is that psychology is going to be as, part, as much a part of UX design as graphic designer as well. You know, when you look at the fields of neuro-linguistic neuro programming and the ways that you can communicate with people and get them to think and act in a certain way, if we're going to have program interfaces that actually communicate with people in that way, then it's very real that psychologists could have an integral part in how to build these interfaces. So these are kind of some of the things I think might happen. And... Yeah, I mean, that, that's generally everything I've got. Um, 
I'm not an expert in this. This is just something I play with in my spare time and do in hackathons. So I'm happy to try and answer any questions you might have about this or about Seek or anything I've been doing. But, yep. When you go through the labor of putting the training data into API.ai, can you pull it out again later? Yeah, it's got import and export, and it's just yeah. basically in JSON format. Is that a standard format, or is it a JSON, yeah. No, I mean like oh right there, uh, they've got. Uh, I'm not aware of it being a standard intention format or anything like that, but they have their format. It's pretty basic, but it changes a lot, so it might be something they might come up with something. Yeah. Uh, when you were looking at different options, did you have a look at the Microsoft Cognitive Services? No, I didn't because they weren't out when I started, oh. uh, and I kind of gone a little bit down the path. And then I had a, I had a brief look at the Microsoft Bot Kit, but it seemed to just be a wrapper around Howdy. So it was like an abstraction over an abstraction. I thought, well, I'm, I'm good with Howdy, so I don't bother. Yep. Um, do you have any thoughts around bots that are proactive? So yes, yes, I do. Uh, so that's where I want to take this, um, because it's, there's kind of a little bit of a, I'm not sure how to, what the morals are around this, but effectively the spot is monitoring everyone it seeks saying all the time, so that's got a bit of a creepy vibe to it already. But I really wanted to be proactive, so rather than waiting for somebody to say, I'd like to give some feedback, I'd like it to be listening in and say, hey, it sounds like, you know, you guys did an awesome job together. Would you like to give some feedback? You know, so you can, you can definitely do that. I just haven't yeah. had the chance to program that in yet. Okay. So yeah, there could be like um, a question around: Do they? Do the people know that the bot is there? Uh, is the bot invited? Yeah, yeah. Um, he's only he's in our main Slack channel at the moment. He's invited in a couple of channels because he helps with certain things, but. Um, yeah, you get in a weird place with that, and we're just going to try and feel our way through it and see what feels right. You know, as soon as it starts feeling creepy or intrusive, we'll probably back off a little bit. Yep. Um, how easy is it, to, is it to move to a different pa um, platform? So, for example, at the moment you've got on Slack. Yeah. Could you easily move it to Skype or any other platform? Apparently, yes. We haven't we haven't tried it, but you know, um, as much as probably the theory of having a data access layer allows you to move from different databases, I'd assume there'll be some quirks with it, basically. But yeah, there's some some of the stuff that you do in the program is seems pretty specific to Slack. But how how difficult that is to change, I don't know. Oh, sorry <laughs> to see. That. Yeah, I'm thinking about things on a broader scale. What kind of um, like meta security implications are there in terms of people opting out from talking to bots or not having their information listened to by a bot just because they're on a channel? Like, is there any? Um, any moves in that direction? Yeah, so like I say, for me, that there's a lot of grey area in there that I think we have to spend a bit of time thinking about and working out what feels right. I mean, you know, I see companies do things like, are you familiar with the Hotjar product? You guys use that at all? Hotjar is a product that you can actually use to monitor your users' um, interactions, and the idea is it gives you a better picture of how people actually interact with your site, but it's also got a bit of a creepware factor to it that you're monitoring what people do. So, yeah, I, I don't have the answers to that. I mean, at the moment I'm focused on how do I actually get it working, and then there's probably a, a can of worms that open up about, is this even right? What are the implications? How comfortable are people? Should they be able to opt in or out? And then already it's sort of sparked some debate. Seek some people have very strong opinions one way or the other. You know, we have to call the site as a bot, and other people, no, hold on, wait a minute, do we? I mean, why? Um, yeah, we haven't explored that fully yet. It's just more of a, a hack at the moment. All done? All good? Mic drop? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>